um, uh, welcome to the first module of the um, NZG2000 deformation model. What is it and how should I use it? An NZIS um, webinar. Uh, just before I start, I'd just like to mention this is the first uh, webinar produced by the um, uh, New Zealand Institute of Surveyors uh, Positioning and Measurement Stream. Uh, this particular module is um, um, entitled Tectonics of New Zealand, and the purpose of it is to set the stage uh, and introduce some concepts that will be used in um, uh, preceding two modules, um, which are given by Chris Crook and Nick Donnelly, uh, some colleagues of mine at the, um, at the uh, Land Information New Zealand. Uh, so, uh, what we're going to cover today uh, is the, uh, uh, say a few things about the Earth's dynamic structure. We're going to introduce plate tectonics, uh, oil poles, and the seismic cycle. Then we're going to focus on New Zealand uh, tectonics. Uh, we're going to go through the important faults in the North Island, occurring in subduction zone primarily, uh, the important um, faults in the Central and Southern and South Island, the Alpine Fault, Marlborough Fault Zone, and then uh, well in the Pusiger subduction zone. We'll uh, um, discuss the secular velocity field of New Zealand, uh, and we'll close by saying a few things about earthquakes and um, uh, earth deformation. Uh, we'll look at, take a careful look at a series of recent earthquakes, which are very important in uh, what the uh, deformation model covers. Uh, we'll look at, a, um, uh, and then we'll look at a few um, e interesting um, uh, uh, consequences of earthquakes, uh, post-size relaxation, and slow slip events. Now, just to start with, um, the reason why there is a deformation model, the reason why um, uh, modern, modern uh, datums incorporate this, uh, is because of the um, uh, plate tectonic, um, uh, the, the existence of plate tectonics. Uh, the idea of plate tectonics is the Earth is divided into a series of rigid plates, uh, which uh, plates move rigidly, as I already said, and uh, they're separated. Uh, by, uh, 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 by boundaries. Um, so the, this blue line here uh, is the boundary between, uh, for in this case, the, uh, well, let's go over to New Zealand, the uh, Australian and the Pacific plate. Now, um, plates uh, outweigh from boundaries move rigidly. What this really means is that they rotate. And you can see this beautifully if you look at the um, uh, the um, uh, uh, velocities from uh, continuous GPS stations in North America, where the, the plate is obviously rotating um, uh, counterclockwise uh, around a point uh, down to the south off um, uh, South America somewhere. Um, uh, that point that it rotates around is called an Euler pole. Now, um, uh, the consequence of that, of course, is that the velocities aren't the same everywhere in a plate. Um, now, if we uh, I, just focusing on um, the New Zealand region, um, uh, this, as I already mentioned, is a plate boundary between the Pacific and Australian plate. So, New Zealand is on a plate boundary, uh, and that right away tells us we've got a, uh, um, a somewhat different problem than, than uh, Australia in places which, don't, which aren't in that situation. Uh, but before I leave this slide, the thing I want you to, re to just uh, uh, go take away with you is. Um, the t uh, is these two is two velocities uh, velocity trends the uh, Chatham um, and Auckland uh, so um, um, and, and this is important because the Chatham uh, velocity represents the Pacific plate velocity uh, in our region and it's trending northwest the Auckland uh, velocity represents the Australian plate velocity in, uh, roughly it's not quite true but it's getting over towards uh, the approximately the Australian plate velocity in a region, and it's trending generally north. Now, New Zealand's on a plate boundary zone, and that means that there must be structures, and by that we mean faults, which take up the uh, different, the fact that uh, uh, one side of uh, New Zealand is moving at uh, 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 velocity, uh, northwest velocity, and the um, uh, the other side is moving uh, in a quite different uh, direction, uh, generally to the north. If we, um, uh, and this, um, uh, in this slide I just want to go through uh, and say a few things about the New Zealand uh, plate boundary zone from north to south. So, um, starting in the north, um, 
the um, uh, the uh, the um, uh, 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 the the um, uh, major structure in this region is the Hikarangi uh, subduction zone, uh, and it represents uh, the um, uh, the Pacific Plate um, uh, 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 being subducted or uh, being um, thrust down below the Australian Plate. Uh, <coughs> Uh, in the no this uh, boundary changes a bit as we go from north to south. In the north, the plate boundary is well offshore, <coughs> and it also um, isn't um, fully locked. So um, um, uh, the uh, the transition between the velocity fields, a lot of that occurs well offshore. As we go further south, the uh, velocity, the uh, uh, Hickerangi margin, uh, the Hickerangi subduction zone uh, comes closer inshore. And it, um, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it becomes much more fully locked. And actually, it's joined by a couple of um, um, faults which actually aren't on the map, but you can ba just barely see them through the topography. Um, there are um, uh, the, uh, a couple of strike slip faults, there are two, uh, uh, several major strike slip faults uh, in the Australian plate, which uh, also contribute. Uh, these are the, the well known Wellington and Wairapa faults, are the major ones and uh, uh, well known to people who live in the Wellington region. Um, uh, uh, further south, the plate boundary zone basically um, changes dramatically. It, um, uh, the, the Hickerangi subduction zone dies out, and the uh, plate boundary structures become uh, the uh, uh, marble faults here and the alpine fault here. Um, so basically, the plate boundary zone is onshore in this part of the South Island. And then um, uh, uh, f uh, further south, actually at uh, um, uh, Milford Sound in northern Fiordland, the plate boundary zone uh, jumps offshore again, and it becomes uh, the, the uh, um, Alpine Fault and the Pusiger subduction zone. Uh, it joins the Pusiger subduction zone. and. Um, uh, basically, the, we have another subduction zone, but in this case, which is shown here and by this uh, cross section, the uh, Australian plate is now thrust over the Pacific plate. Well, we have plate boundary structures. What happens on these structures? Um, uh, we'll start, um, uh, we'll we basically have a, uh, a sequence which we call the uh, seismic cycle. Um, if we start after a major earthquake, um, uh, as time goes by, the um, uh, different sides of the plate boundary move in different directions. That's what a plate boundary, uh, uh, that's what a plate boundary zone in effect means. Uh, and um, uh, these reflect the different uh, uh, velocities of the plates in this, uh, in the, the uh, uh, plates in this region. So we have a transition between two different velocity uh, uh, directions. Um, uh, the, uh, 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 as a result, we have a velocity field, um, and we see the vectors change uh, uh, across the plate boundary zone. We think that these velocities are basically constant with time, so we call them the secular velocity field. Now, if you have a crust, if you have a piece of um, a crust or any other piece of solid material, and you uh, uh, move one side in one direction, one side in the other, what's going to happen? We're going to strain the material, that will cause stresses, and so we have a uh, situation where we're building up um, stress in the material. Eventually this stress becomes greater than the fault can stand. It will suddenly slip again, in effect break like a beam, a and we'll have an earthquake. So. Um, uh, at this point, uh, instead of having a gradual uh, uh, transition across the plate boundary, uh, we have a sudden um, um, uh, displacement on the fault, and then we basically establish a new uh, equilibrium, and the whole process starts again. So just as a review, uh, two processes, there's a um, uh, continuously, all the time, um, we have a, um, a situation where um, the, uh, we have a velocity gradient across the plate boundary. That's the secular velocity field, constant in time. Occasionally, we have earthquakes, which are instantaneous displacements. Uh, and then we have a cycle that uh, starts all over again. Um, so 
But what we'll do now is we'll take a look at the secular velocity field and, and earthquakes, because these are two separate problems that a deformation model has to deal with. Uh, starting with the secular velocity field. Uh, this basically um, is uh, from a, uh, mo the most recent compilation of um, the secular velocity field. It's um, um, uh, from a paper which is currently in press in NZJGG. Uh, um, the, um, the, uh, basically, uh, what we see in the secular velocity field uh, is um, uh, a uh, transition that kind of reflects the tectonics. So let's take a uh, look at it and see how this relates to what we've already said about the plate boundary zone. Um, in the northern North Island, um, the velocities are generally consistent with the, uh, uh, um, the uh, Australian plate velocities. Uh, and that kind of relates to the fact that we said that much of the transition between the Pacific and Australian plates has already occurred offshore. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated than that. We see that these velocities are trending northeast, not north. Um, uh, and that has something to do with extension in the North Island. But uh, that's, uh, um, uh, as a general rule, uh, the, uh, the uh, velocities transformations occurred uh, offshore. As we go further south, the uh, Hikarangi margin becomes more and more locked. It's joined by uh, onshore uh, faults. And so in the southern North Island, uh, we see the transition from the Australian plate to the Pacific plate beginning to occur onshore. So we have northwest trending velocities trending, uh, turning into uh, generally uh, um, uh, northerly uh, trending velocities. Um, and that occurs across the uh, southern South Island. Um, now. In the South Island, uh, the situation is uh, quite different because the tectonics are quite different. We're dealing with an on-land um, plate boundary zone, um, uh, and uh, as a result of the, um, um, the fact that the major plate boundary faults are on land, we see the transition between the Australian plate and the Pacific plate velocities uh, reflected in these uh, velocities in the secular velocity field. One other thing I'd like to point out, um, I can find, there we are, if I can find the mouse. The, um, uh, uh, um, uh, when the, uh, the Alpine Fault uh, is the uh, dominant uh, plate boundary structure, we see a very rapid transition in the western uh, uh, South Island. And then as we go further south, uh, after the uh, Alpine Fault has um, uh, 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 jumped offshore and uh, uh, joined a subduction zone, uh, we see a much more gradual transition, uh, which is incomplete uh, because the uh, plate boundary zone uh, is, uh, is, is actually uh, located offshore. Now, that's the secular velocity field. The other thing that the uh, deformation model have to deal with are earthquakes. Earthquakes are very different. They're very sudden transitions. Uh, they, they occur within a, 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 a few seconds or minutes, so effectively instantaneous as far as surveyors are concerned. And what's more, they, um, uh, the, for some earthquakes, the um, uh, transition, the, um, um, uh, it, it, if we're move, look, walking across uh, an earthquake zone, the, um, instead of being spread out over a large area, as is the case with uh, the secular velocity field, the um, uh, transition, um, uh, uh, the displacement can very suddenly change. And that, uh, uh, that happens if the uh, fault breaks the surface. A really nice example of that is the um, uh, 2010 uh, Darfield earthquake, which we'll say more about. Uh, it's a picture of it. And we can see that the fault trace is here. And there's a sudden uh, uh, transition of uh, oh, about three meters uh, in, um, say, this road. Uh, the road center line, the, the, the road basically shifts by half the road width. So quite a different problem uh, 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 to deal with as far as a uh, uh, deformation model is concerned. Now, how do we deal with earthquakes? Um, uh, we, we basically deal with earthquakes by developing a model of them. Uh, the model starts with uh, geology and seismology, and geophysics too. Um, so uh, the uh, geologists and uh, geophysicists um, basically um, uh, use the measurements they have uh, to outline the 
fault plane that uh, causes the earthquake, and that gives us basically the geometry of the um, uh, uh, of the um, uh, uh, the earthquake, uh, and that's an important uh, that's a basic constraint to developing a numerical model. The next thing we have to do is um, get something to constrain the model with, and we do that. Um, by taking points which we've measured uh, with uh, uh, GNSS uh, uh, technology. Um, uh, the best ones, of course, are cores, but we don't all have as many cores as we'd like, so we have to go out and remeasure points. And these uh, give us um, uh, detailed information of how the Earth actually slipped during an earthquake. That's actually joined now by uh, a new technology, um, it's been around actually for the um, uh, best part of 20 years, but it's becoming more and more um, uh, mature now, um, called INSAR, which gives us an enormous um, spatial density of information as to how uh, the uh, uh, points on the Earth are changing. Um, and uh, we have a very strong um, uh, INSAR program at GNSS now, uh, sorry, GNS now, and uh, uh, Land Information New Zealand is also um, a developing capacity. Um, the next thing that we do, uh, well, using all this information and the geometry of the fault plane, we develop a geophysical fault uh, model. Now, a geophysical fault model um, is uh, a, uh, a, mo a numerical model of the earthquake. It follows the trend of the uh, faults that we've been uh, that we're told about by uh, geologists and uh, seismologists. Um, and what it basically does is it uh, takes the uh, trend of the fault plane, it um, um, uh, breaks the fault plane up into a series of small subfaults. Uh, we call these uh, dislocations. Uh, each dislocation is a little fault which slips at a uniform amount. Uh, this is obviously not realistic for a complex earthquake like Darfield, so what we do is we take a whole bunch of them um, uh, and um, uh, uh, develop a composite fault model, which is the sum of all of these uh, little parts. We'll see this a bit better in some, uh, the, some of the next uh, slides. And then, using this model, we can uh, determine the contribution of each little subfault, add them up, and what we end up with are model displacements. Um, um, and those model displacements are what are really key uh, and the basic uh, information that goes into the deformation model. Now let's take a look at one of the, there are a series of uh, major earthquakes that have occurred in New Zealand uh, in the last uh, 10 years. We're going to um, uh, take a look at, um, uh, uh, at, at, at three of them. Um, uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is the Dusky Sound earthquake. Uh, that was an earthquake that occurred in 2009. Um, it's very big, it had a magnitude of about 7.8. It, um, uh, uh, it, uh, um, uh, it, it occurred on the Pusiger subduction zone that we talked about, so it was part of the Pusiger subduction zone breaking. And um, um, uh, on this slide, uh, you can see the model that John Bevan of GNS Science developed. Uh, each one of these little pixels that you can see here represents the um, uh, the uh, 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 one of the subfaults that I talked about, one of the individual dislocations, uh, and um, uh, we can model the uh, uh, motion on the subductions on, uh, on this earthquake uh, by um, uh, taking uh, the contribution of each one of these uh, subfaults and um, uh, uh, summing them up. Um, now. Um, uh, the, um, uh, and when we sum them up, we can compare the, um, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, calculated uh, displacement uh, for each one of the points that we measured. Uh, the red arrows in this case represent the calculated um, displacement. The blue arrows represent the uh, observed displacement. And as you can see, there's a generally a pretty good fit, although uh, uh, there's some very small um, deviations um, uh, just right over the epicentral region, uh, but basically did a very good job. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out just before I leave is the magnitude 
of uh, slip that occurred on the fault. In this case, the slip uh, uh, on the fault was um, getting up to five meters, whereas the uh, total measured displacement was, uh, was uh, well over a meter uh, for this earthquake. Um, now, once the earthquake occurs, we have um, uh, um, some ongoing adjustment. Um, the, uh, the, the, the model that I had presented in the seismic cycle is somewhat idealized, isn't quite what happens. Uh, after an earthquake, uh, the, um, uh, the, there's, a, there's a time when the uh, Earth continues to readjust uh, to the uh, changes due to the earthquake. We call this post-seismic relaxation. And this is shown very nicely here um, uh, for uh, uh, the Pusiger subduction zone, which had a, quite a lot of uh, post-seismic relaxation. Um, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, the uh, Dusky Sound earthquake, and uh, as you can see, the post-seismic the uh, uh, co-seismic uh, slip represents this blue line between these. Oh, sorry, each one of these red dots represents the uh, 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 represents the instant the uh, point a daily uh, position of a continuous GPS receiver. Now, um, um, uh, so. Um, uh, uh, before the earthquake, what we see is, the, uh, is a line that represents the sector of velocity. Then there's a sudden change, where there's kind of this, uh, this blue line, uh, and that represents roughly the co-seismic uh, uh, um, uh, slip, the instantaneous slip. Um, uh, it's not actually quite true because, of course, it represents the uh, uh, d difference between two daily solutions, but still, uh, basically, uh, th that's the story. And then um, uh, after the earthquake, we can see uh, the, uh, there's a trend, particularly in the uh, uh, north component, where the, um, of, uh, the position continues to change uh, in a nonlinear manner, um, uh, and this represents uh, post-seismic relaxation. And actually, while well, it, gets, it gets a bit harder to see as we get further from the earthquake, it's still ongoing now. And we can see this continues to bluff, uh, Mavora Lakes, uh, and even up through central Otago. Uh, and it's measurable as far north as, um, um, uh, well, uh, uh, nearly to Christchurch. The next earthquake that I'd like to say a few things about is the um, September uh, 2010 Darfield earthquake. Uh, this was the largest of the Canterbury earthquake sequence. It's the, um, uh, and I showed you the um, effect of this earthquake on the field. Um, with the photos which uh, we, uh, we showed when we introduced this earthquake uh, part of the talk. The um, uh, same story, basically, as with the Darfield earthquake. Uh, we have uh, the dislocations, uh, individual dislocations show up as uh, pixels. Um, in the major part of the fault, we don't see the pixels very well because the fault was a strike slip fault, so the, the fault plane is nearly vertical, and so it doesn't project very well in this uh, uh, image. Uh, and the blue uh, represents the observed um, uh, earthquake shifts, uh, and the red represents the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, earthquake, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, modeled um, uh, uh, deformation. Um, just a few things I'd like to point out. Uh, generally, this model does a really good job with uh, modeling the displacement. However, it's important as users of the deformation model that we realize that in some places, the deformation model, uh, the uh, geophysical model from the earthquake, isn't perfect and may contain errors. As you can see, for the, for the points right up, right near the, um, uh, or the, uh, the um, uh, fault plane, uh, the um, earth, uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 there are some uh, significant uh, errors on the order of say about um, 15 to 20 centimeters. So we should be aware, and th these would even be greater as we get uh, immediately adjacent to the fault plane. So we have to be careful to apply the when we apply the deformation model in the region right adjacent to where the um, earthquake occurs. Um, now, the, s the third earthquake I want to say a few things about is the February 22nd, 2011 earthquake. This is quite a bit smaller than the Darfield earthquake that I just showed you. It's the second earthquake in the, Canterbury in the uh, Christchurch earthquake sequence, second major earthquake in the Canterbury earthquake sequence. And it, um, 
Um, uh, uh, it, it has some rather interesting uh, features, and also very important for, uh, for Christchurch. Uh, it was a 6.3, uh, so it was significantly smaller as the, than the Darfield earthquake, uh, but it still produced really major effects within Christchurch, both uh, um, uh, damage and uh, uh, as far as uh, changes in geodetic position. Uh, once again, this represents the uh, deformation model that uh, 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 John Bevan developed for this, uh, uh, for this earthquake, and which is incorporated in the New Zealand deformation model. Um, uh, really, the, uh, uh, the point I'd like to make about this earthquake is, um, is this was a blind thrust. It didn't break the surface the way the, um, um, uh, the Darfield earthquake did, so we don't have a sudden discontinuity. As a general rule, the, earth, the, the um, uh, geophysical model does a really good job modeling the uh, deformation over quite a large part of um, Christchurch. However, we see in this region here, um, over uh, in eastern Christchurch, um, uh, 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 particularly in um, the, um, uh, uh, the New Brighton area, um, that the um, uh, and, and uh, the areas that which are, which have suffered liquefaction during this earthquake, uh, that the uh, model doesn't work very well. The reason why this is true isn't the it has nothing to do with the uh, earthquake model itself. Uh, it, it's uh, it's occurred because the liquefaction process uh, has caused uh, significant amounts of ground motion, and it's a different process. Uh, the uh, geophysical model is modeling the, uh, the uh, slip on a deep underlying fault. Liquefaction is a different process. It's not incorporated in the, in the model, so we would in fact expect a very good fit here. So uh, once again, this is an area where the um, deformation model um, uh, really can't be used to model the, uh, um, uh, the uh, surface deformation. But everywhere else in Christchurch, it works very well. Um, okay, and now that's, I'm just going to close by uh, introducing one other type of deformation that occurs in New Zealand. It's rather unusual, um, uh, and it occurs, uh, it's, uh, it occurs in the eastern North Island and the northern South Island. Uh, this is, uh, uh, these are called um, a different type of um, uh, of uh, activity where the uh, fault plane, instead of breaking in an instantaneous way, breaks, uh, 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 but the break uh, uh, takes um, uh, periods of maybe a week up to a couple of months to be complete. So in effect, uh, we have what is re really a very slow earthquake, although the term slow earthquake is used by seismologists to mean something else, but it's a, um, uh, it's a, um, 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 uh, a, a type of uh, uh, displacement on a fault which does not produce significant earthquakes. We didn't know it existed until we had continuous GPS and uh, because we don't feel any shaking from it. Um, th this represents, um, and I've to, to illustrate this, uh, the, uh, the effect of slow slip events, I've taken results from three stations uh, along the, in the eastern uh, so North Island and um, uh, Northern South Island, so um, uh, from Nelson up to Hicks Bay. Um, uh, in Hicks Bay, um, uh, we don't see any slow slip events at all. Uh, there may be some very small ones, but we haven't uh, ever, um, we don't really uh, see slow slip events as an important, um, um, it do doesn't seem to contribute to the uh, uh, traces that we get from continuous GPS, uh, GNSS measurements. Uh, a little bit further south, around Gisborne, we have um, a um, uh, a a series of um, uh, quite um, large slow slip events. Uh, uh, we have a whole series of uh, slow slip events that occur um, uh, repeatedly. They're very high frequency. You can see them here. Um, uh, we have one uh, um, uh, basically. Uh, one big one every year, uh, and they have an amplitude of about two centimeters. Um, farther south, uh, in the Nelson area, we still see slow slip events, but they're rare. Uh, they're, they're much less common, and they have a much larger uh, amplitude. Um, uh, they have larger amplitude, uh, 
uh, they're lower frequency uh, uh, and uh, uh, they occur um, uh, uh, more rarely. Um, and then if we go further south down to Kaikoura, soul slip events no longer occur. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is a phenomenon that really isn't incorporated into the zonal deformation model yet, uh, but I want you to be aware of it because it's something that may um, uh, become, um, it, it certainly has an effect on uh, coordinates and it may, is something that may be incorporated later. And uh, that's really the end of uh, uh, this module.